Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? Well, glad to have you all here. Everybody from uh, that came to the cleanup day, thank you for coming. It, uh, we got a lot accomplished, a lot cleaned, and uh, a lot uh, weeded out, too. A lot of stuff that's been here for a long time that doesn't have a purpose. So uh, it was a good time. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> We've been here for a long time, and we've been trying to go through some of that stuff, and it's it's overwhelming when you're trying to do it by yourself. So, uh, we do appreciate that. Other announcements: uh, Remember Bible study on Wednesday nights at five o'clock, and Sunday nights at six o'clock. We have the prayer meeting. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight in the bulletin there is on the 19th of May at Bible study, the blank, blank family is going to be coming. Uh, some of you've already have met uh, her. Uh, they're a, a missionary couple to Uganda, and they're going to be coming and talking about uh, what they're doing there in Uganda. They're going to be heading back shortly. In June, they're going to be heading back over there. Uh, they were back on furlough. They had been over there seven years, came back on furlough because I can't remember if it was her dad or his dad passed away. They came back, and now they're going to be going back over to, to start a little bit different uh, thing than what they've been doing before. Working with the same people, though, so if you want to come out and check that out. We wanted them to come on Wednesday, too, because she, the ministry that she has to the women there in the village uh, is uh, they've they basically taught them how to make baskets and do a bunch of different jewelry and all that. She purchases all that stuff from them and, and helps support them in that way and then uses all the money from that she sells that stuff for to just pour back into the women. So uh, she'll be bringing some of that stuff, too. So. <laughs> So if you want to come out and check that out, that'd be great. May 19th at, uh, at Bible study. All right. For a call to worship this morning, I'm going to be reading uh, Psalm 95. Josh used it last week in the sermon. It's back in the sermon this week, too. So I figured we'll do it for a call to worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Uh, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah. In the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the, the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are, they are a people who uh, go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence. Lord, as we do that, that your spirit would fill this place with your, your, your presence, Lord. And as we enter into worship, that we'd be able to set aside the busyness, the craziness of the week and of the morning, and then we'd just be able to enter into your presence and have you speak into our lives as we sing songs to you, sing praises to you, as we come before you with prayer requests, and as we hear from your word. Would you speak to us? Would you mold us into your image and help us to be representatives to you, to this lost and dying world? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.
this morning? We have a friend uh, named Dickie Halter and she has cancer pain just increased so much that she can't bear to stand up and walk right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Josiah. Uncle Okay, Uncle Charlie, yep, we'll pray for Uncle Charlie, okay? <laughs> Anybody else? Let's go together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, the privilege once again of being able to come into your presence, uh, to be able to gather and to worship together. And as we bring our uh, request before you, before we do that, we want to just praise you for who you are, that you indeed are the Lord God Almighty, that you uh, have shown your power and your might in your creation, that creation speaks for itself, shows that there is a maker, that you are that maker. And Lord, as we see this time of year with uh, spring and the flowers coming and uh, the buds on the trees and all of those things coming uh, into new life, Lord, it's, uh, it's uh, invigor invigorating, it's exhilarating uh, uh, to be able to be in, in the world and to be able to live and to have fellowship with one another. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, just to realize how great and awesome you are, that we would bask in your presence and that we would be drawn to you, that we would love you uh, in deeper and deeper ways as we go through each day. Uh, Lord, that we would understand that we would, we would be able to uh, be in awe of you uh, even more than we were the day before. So Lord, as we go through uh, life and as we seek after you, uh, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you reveal yourself in new ways? And would you show us your strength and power and might? Lord, we bring these requests before you and ask that you would work in them uh, and that uh, through that you would be brought glory and honor, whatever the situation is and whatever you're going to do in those. Uh, we submit to that. We give that to you. And we know that you will work what is best in those situations. Uh, Lord, we lift up the Perkins family uh, with the, the drowning of Ryan. Lord, I pray that you would draw near to them, that you would give them strength, that you would give them peace. Uh, Lord, that uh, if, uh, if they don't know you, Father, that you, they would come to see you as their comfort and their peace and their strength at this time. Uh, Lord, that they would uh, come to a saving knowledge of you. For uh, Vicki, Lord, we lift her before you with the cancer uh, and just uh, having really difficult uh, standing and walking and lots and lots of pain. Uh, Lord, we pray for wisdom for the doctors. We pray for direction for the doctors to be able to know what's going on and to see uh, what is the best uh, uh, course of action. So, Lord, we pray for her. We pray for healing in her life, as we do for all these others that have cancer. There's so many on the list here. Pastor Sam over there in the pavilion. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue to work in him and keep that inflammation at bay uh, so he doesn't have to be relying on that steroid so much. Lord, that you would remove that. Uh, Lord, we lift uh, um, the others up that we have in here. Uh, Charlie Page, we lift him before you and ask that you would draw near to him that you would give him strength as he goes through the radiation and the chemo. Uh, and Lord, just uh, give Diane strength as well uh, as she tries to take care of him and, and, and support him. Lord, we lift up Peanut as well as she's nearing the end of the, the chemo and the radiation treatments. Father, we pray that she would be able to continue strong in that, uh, that her blood counts and all of that would stay where they need to be so she can finish that out. And then that week, though, that five weeks of healing before surgery, Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon her and that the the chemo and radiation will do the job that it needs to do and eradicate that cancer that's there. Uh, Lord, we lift up uh, Pat Kruzak as well with, uh, um, with stage four cancer and now uh, COVID and uh, has pneumonia uh, set in as well. Lord, we lift that before you. Uh, pray for Mike and Teresa next door as that's uh, Teresa's mom. Lord, we pray for strength. Uh, we 
pray for uh, just a healing in her life. We know that you have that power, that ability, uh, if it be your will. So we ask that you would work in that way. The others on the list this morning, Father, we lift them before you know those, those needs. Uh, I want to lift up Mr. Reeve as we've been praying for him for quite some time. Uh, developed uh, AFib this week and uh, had needing surgery on his hip, and now that he has to have surgery in the heart before he can have surgery on the hip. And the cancer is just making the bones brittle. So, Father, we pray your healing hand upon him. It's been such a, a struggle and such a, a long time here, it seems, uh, that he's been dealing with this. And the cancer just seems to keep coming back. So, Father, we pray for healing in his life. Pray for his son that uh, goes to school, Becca. Uh, Lord, that he'd be able to finish strong through the semester and, and keep his focus as he as he graduates uh, here uh, in May. So, Lord, we pray that you would just draw near him and, and, and the family, too. Uh, for Jack Hauschnick and his family, Lord, we pray for uh, we pray for that entire situation. You, will, you know what's best in that. We ask for healing. We know that you have that power and ability. We ask that you would do that. Uh, Father, that you would just draw near to the family and give them peace and comfort and strength at this time. Lord, as we come before you, uh, we thank you that we can bring these to you and, and know that we can just lay them at your feet and not have to worry about them, that you, you have them under control. Lord, it's a hard thing to do sometimes, but help us to do that. Help us to lay them at your feet and allow you to work in those situations. May we see how you're working, not just in the big situations that are going on in people's lives, but in every day of our life, that we would see you working in those little things, because you care about the little things in our lives, too, and we thank you that you do love us in that way. Be with Josh as he comes and brings the message, Father. Give him the ability to communicate what you've laid upon his heart and uh, strengthen him and uh, allow him just to uh, lay that out for us. Help us to grab a hold of it and apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Josh. Six. We have passed the halfway point of Ephesians. And the first part of Ephesians, we talked about our relationship between us and God. That's a vertical relationship. Now we're going to be talking more about our relationship with each other. Right? And you'll see, especially today, there's a lot of overlap in that. And that's because we were adopted as sons and daughters. We are family. And a family represents each other. As individual people, we represent each other, but we represent God. So these relationships are reflections of each other. So let's read Ephesians 4, 1 and 6. I, therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been Call. So it says, therefore, that means it's referring back to what we were talking about in the first three chapters. It's in light of our giftedness, of God's riches to us, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, his choosing us and adopting us as sons and daughters. So in light of that, therefore, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord. And this is part of Paul's self-titling in another part of Ephesians, the chapter right before it, chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And we focus on the Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So Paul is a prisoner of Rome. He uh, <clears throat> has been captured and persecuted for his faith. And he takes responsibility for but he's also saying something a little bit deeper than that. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. As if 
It's not just the Romans that have imprisoned him. It's God that's imprisoned him and kept him captive. It says in Romans 6, 20 and 22, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. Amen. So when we are children, we are loved by God. We are created in his image because he loved us. But we also reviled him because we were enslaved to the systems of the world, right? The humanistic system, the uh, material system, sexual perversion, all manner of temptation we were enslaved to, and we were helpless. So, in a sense, our ownership has kind of changed, and we, we have a submissive mindset if we're thinking that we are prisoners of the Lord. Paul is basically saying that God's will is my will. His standards are my standards. And his vision for salvation is also my vision for salvation. And that is a complete and utter surrender of your will and yourself to God. When you reach that point, you have truly allowed the life of Christ to live through you. It's no longer your life. So Paul is not looking for a plea for sympathy from the Ephesians. He is just laying out his commitment to following God's plan for him, even in the midst of imprisonment. So it goes on to say, I urge you. And across different translations, urge is used as entreat or beseech. But <clears throat> it comes from the same root, root word, which is parakelio, which is to call the one side, a wanting to help, or be helped. So this is not just a request. This is a plea. And Paul can't do these things that we're about to uncover in the following verses. He can't do that for the Ephesians. They have to do it for themselves. So he pleads them to do it, right? Not just asking them. He pleads that they do it. And he uses this seemingly dramatic language in other parts of the passages of scripture he's written like in acts 26 verse 3 this is him talking to king agrippa especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the jews therefore i beg you to listen to me patiently and in second corinthians 2 verse 8 he's talking to the corinthians so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. And in Romans 9, verses 1 and 3, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So there's a lot we can go into there, but this is another realization of the helplessness Paul has in regards to other people's choices. He would rather be cut off from Christ. That's basically saying, I would rather suffer eternal punishment in hell than have any of you have to suffer that punishment and have anyone else who would make that decision against salvation. I would rather suffer on their behalf. <clears throat> and he uses the word wish, and that's because that is a wish. He can't do that. That's not how it works. <clears throat> so he goes on. It says, walk worthy of the calling which you have been received. The word for uh, worthy is axios, which is to balance the scales. There is an expectation of something else. It's really the the idea that the laborer is worthy of his hire, right? You do the work, you get a wage. 
and it should balance out that the work and effort you put in, you're worthy at that wage. It's kind of a controversial statement these days. You put in the work, you get the wage, it balances out. That's the idea of being worthy of that wage and worthy of the calling. So, worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The word for calling is kalesis. And it calls back to, really, our calling to salvation. Right? That's what he's referring to. Worthy of that calling. That call to salvation. Let's look back in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 3 and 5. Blessed be the Lord, and <clears throat> blessed be the, let's try that again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So it's that we were drawn to him, right? We talked about that in talking about choosing for salvation, predestination. He's drawn those to himself. It says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory, so it's from this calling that we are to walk in a way worthy of that gift, that gift of salvation, the gift, of, the giftedness of his riches and blessings. That is in the way that we should walk. So moving on in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 2 and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So here we see essential heart attitudes and principles that we are supposed to put into effect, right? There is something on our part that we have to do, not for salvation, but for the Christian life. And without these, we're not fully living to the fullest of the expectation. We're not walking the path worthy of that calm. Because this is how we're to treat one another. Because we've been called to love as Christ has loved us. So, the first one, humility. And the word for humility, I'm gonna try to say it. It's a long compound word. I'm gonna try to say it. Tepinophorus. I've tried this so many times. It sounds so wrong. It sounds more like Italian or something. But the idea is that there wasn't a Greek word for humility. This is a compound word that means to think and to judge with lowliness and to have lowliness of mind. That seems kind of blunt and awkward. And that's because, again, there was no Greek word for humility because humility was seen as weakness. The attributes of humility were weakness. So if there was a Greek word for humility, it would have been a variation of whatever word they had for weakness. And even because it's a, such an unnatural inner man, even pagans centuries later would use that against Christians saying that they're weak. They would use the same word against them to call them weak and to belittle them. Yet humility is foundational to our relationship with God. It's the most foundational principle we are going to talk about today. And we talked a little bit about humility humility last week in the prayer positions um, of how we express that. Um, we're going to look at uh, Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And 1 John 2, 6 echoes... Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in each which he walked. So this is kind of cool looking at these passages. You had a question about what the humility of Christ was or how you should express that. It says here, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way of which he walked. So even unto death, he humbled himself 
to that point. That's what we're called to do. We looked at passages where Christ said, love others like you, like I loved you. And that was to the point of death and crucifixion. So, but humility is kind of sensitive and interesting for the foundational principle of our walk. Because if you say, like, I'm the most humble person you ever met, <laughs> that's not humility, that's pride. It's the exact opposite. So, be careful of that. Um... A monk, this is an uh, interesting quote I found about humility. It's an interesting little uh, viewpoint of how we should view humility. It was a monk by the name of Bernard Clairvaux, a French monk in a monastery. And uh, he wrote about saying about humility, humility is the virtue by which man becomes conscious of his own unworthiness. So, that means... Really, there's three stages of awareness, right? There's a stage of awareness of our shortcomings and sins, which then leads us to see that God's standards are way higher than ours, which leads us to the final level that he's our creator, he is our Lord. Just like we saw in Psalms 95, 1 through 6, and I like how you read the rest of it, talking about God's wrath brand against us or against them because that emphasizes fear of the Lord. When it talks about Lord our God, our maker, it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are, all, are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. And emphasizing that, we also have the fear of the Lord. Because he is God and Father, but again, he's Lord and maker. He has the right to command and be obeyed, and he created us. And out of his love, he chose us to be his image on earth. And out of love, he chose us and saved us. So it's the same humility we have for God, our Father, and Lord, and Maker, that we need to express to one another. Simply because no one of us is more righteous than the other. We were united in Christ because we were sinful. We were defined by sin. We needed saving, and Christ has united us in that regard. So we show humility to one another because not there's not any of us who is better than the other. The opposite of that is being prideful. And that shows our relationship with God and our collective relationship with God and that humility with each other actually helps strengthen us. It's not a weakness. It's strengthening. So, next we see gentleness. This is a byproduct of humility. This is the next step and expression of humility. It can also be seen as meekness, which is a little bit, means a little bit different. It carries the same general idea. But it's also seen as weakness. And I'm have the definition, the modern definitions of uh, gentleness and meekness. And uh, let's look at this. The quality of being kind, tender, or mild-mannered. This is gentleness. Soft of affection or effect of likeness. Doesn't sound too bad, right? Definition of meekness. The fact or condition of being meek. Submissiveness. That's something that our world today doesn't like to extol, right? That's seen as weakness, submissiveness, and really being light, affection, mild-mannered. Yeah, that's seen as weakness. So we can see in the modern definition, maybe I'm reading into it a little bit, but I really don't think I am. I think if you take a good look at the world around us, you can see that these virtues 
are not desirable, right? Aggression is desirable. Striking back at people is desirable. But meekness and gentleness is far from weakness. Is power under control? It says in 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 8, when Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rock. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave and Saul went to relieve himself. That's who was giggling about that. <laughs> I heard you. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here's the day of which the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David heart, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to the men, The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, lowercase L-O-R-D, the Lord's, capital L-O-R-D, anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's, capital L-O-R-D, anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, lowercase L-O-R-D, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. So this is a very interesting kind of intense back and forth situation that's going on. But the general idea is that David had the opportunity to take Saul out and that would have relieved a lot of the issues that he was having. Saul was trying to get after and kill him because he was jealous of him. So he could have just took, taken him out, but he realized that he was God's anointed, Saul was God's anointed, and that's right, God did have Saul anointed as king, and it was not his position to strike back and take him out, right? That is not the position he was in. And he recognized that this wasn't from the order of another lord, lowercase l-o-r-d, which was Saul, and that is that he has the right to be, to command and be obeyed, amongst men, but he was receiving that call from the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that you don't touch my anointed, I'll do with him as I please. I'm not finished with him. So we see kind of the opposite um, effect of meekness, right? Because it's power under control. That means there's a power there and even a righteous anger that kind of just has a right place to come out. It says in Matthew 21, starting at verse 12, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house should be called the house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So we see that Jesus is showing righteous anger. And he's often called somebody who's meek. And if you think of meekness, you also think more of the gentle softness, right? But this was a place where that power and that righteous anger really was um, required or justified. And really, we have that same righteous anger. We're about to talk about patience, but if our will is God's will, if his standards are our standards, right, and his vision for salvation is our vision for salvation, and we have surrendered our whole being to him, what reviles him reviles us. What angers him angers us. So there's nothing wrong with having righteous anger. And keep in mind, because we can often express that anger towards other people, a man of meekness is somebody 
who recognizes sinful people will do sinful things. Imagine that. People who are sinful will sin. But he doesn't make excuses for them. He doesn't make excuses of, you know, saying, well, that's just you. Do your thing. No. But he recognizes that they're sinful. So that they will sin and they're helplessly trapped in that system. And he sees his former self in them. And um, I don't know about any of you, if you see somebody who reminds you of themselves in their sin, it's easy to get really uptight, angry, and like just kind of overpassionate about that. Because you feel like, I know the right answer. Why aren't they making the right choice? Right? It's easy to do that. But in light of that, that requires patience. Because just as God has worked with you and through you, it took patience. So you have to show that same patience and consistency with them. So patience. Patience is the next virtue. In the Greek is macrothumia, which means long temper. So that doesn't mean that there isn't the explosion at the one end, that the dynamite's not there, but the fuse is rather long. And it takes a while to get there. And sometimes if it's not warranted, you can shut it out, right? The fuse is long, that's the idea. And the expression of meekness is gentleness, and it leads to patience. And as uh, you're able to hate the sin, but love the sin. That's the idea of what we were talking about with meekness. Hate the sin, love the sinner, be with them through that journey. We also see patience is not desirable in our culture. I think you can just look around, there's zero patience for anything. But we see in the Greek culture and in the culture of that time, patience was not a virtue that people wanted to extol. A uh, popular philosopher, Aristotle, said, it would be better not to tolerate insults, rather you should readily strike back. So don't let people walk all over you, because after all, whatever you're doing and whoever you want to be is all that exists. Therefore, anyone who insults you, you strike back, right? You show them. But in our submissiveness, in our giving that life up to God, we've given up that pride of self. So if others are insulting us, that it's no big thing, right? It says we'll be persecuted. That's kind of the lower level of persecution being insulted, right? Um, it's not an insult of God that they would insult you, right? So calm down, don't get offended. There's no need for that. So it goes for us today. And it's easy, it's easy to get caught up in what's happening in life or what's not happening. When we're in the trenches of life, we often forget that God has a plan for us, that he's promised something for us, that something would happen. But when we don't see the results or the results that we want, we get angry. And really, a story I think of, or at least something I think of as patience, is my dad. I think of patience because we came here a few years ago through West Meadowbrook. And over time, people started coming here, people started leaving, right? And we weren't sure what we were going to do about keeping the doors open. And after a while, they said, you should shut the doors. It's not worth it. But, and I talked with Dad, I don't want to speak on his part, uh, behalf, but I talked with him. We, we had many hours long conversation into the night in prayer about this and he said, we should not leave yet. God has more for us to do. And if that meant Wednesday night Bible studies, Sunday morning prayers, that's what we did. Not many people were there, but the idea was that if there's one other person coming that we can minister to. The ministry is still alive here, and we still need to be here. People came and they went, and then Amy started coming, Jan started coming, 
And then really before you know it, look around you, right? I'm not saying this to like glorify my dad or my family or myself. It was patience on our part. Because God, God told us we weren't done here yet. And it's obvious we're still not. We're not done. Amen. So, bearing in love. Bearing with one another in love. So from patience, we have according to the meekness, we bear with one another in love. And this isn't to say that it's a labor for us to love one another, right? That's not what it's saying, that bearing the load of love, oh, how hard it is. It's understanding that, again, other people are defined by sin. So in bearing with one another in love, that carries the idea of patience. It says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. So bearing in love is agape love. That's really what it is. You could just sum it up as agape love. Selfless love. The love Christ had selflessly of sacrifice. And it had the obligation, right? An obligation to act on that love. And that was him coming and dying on the cross. And all of this ties into unity. The outcome is unity of these practices through the bond of peace. Peace that we have because we believe. Peace that we have because we believe and we are collective as a church. And we'll talk more about unity as we go forward in Ephesians. Again, I look very much forward to the Armor of God passage as kind of the wrap-up of what we do with that unity, these are the practices that we are to use first. And I was thinking about this, and this is kind of a little idea I think we'll use going forward, so make a note of it. The strengthening of the army of God starts with the strengthening of the individual. The strengthening of the army of God starts with the strengthening of the individual. And that's not to say that the strengthening of the body as a whole, as the church, isn't important. That's certainly important. But it's kind of like that idea. I'm sure many of us have heard it. The, when you're flying in the airplane, the mask drop down. Put your own mask on first so that you can then help those around you. Because if you run out of air and just kind of, you know, you're, you're worthless. You're, you're not going to help. Sorry, that was a little harsh. You're not going to help. You're going to weaken the chain. So, man, that just sounds so harsh. But it's true. Like It starts at the individual level. And we bring that to the body. And in our gathering on Sundays, and our gathering on the, uh, the prayer meetings and the uh, Bible studies, we strengthen the rest of the body too. But it starts with those daily practices in your own life. So moving on, Ephesians 4, 4 and 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And we see the emphasis of one a lot. That's significant because in the world of the Ephesians and in the ancient world of that time, there was polygamy. Many different gods, many different entities to devote your time, energy, and resources to. So again, verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called, to the one hope that belongs to your call. So one body of believers, that is the church, not just us, the world, the world of Christians is the church. One spirit, the Holy Spirit, Christ's life. Christ's um, power given within us, the Holy Spirit. One hope and the call of salvation, the hope that we have in that and because of that, and to live Christ-like because of our salvation. And we have hope in that because we know what we, he's done for us. We know what he's promised for us. So we live that out in our lives because we know it will come to fruition. 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now. 
And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So moving on, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. So there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. So one Lord, there is no polygamy in the church of Christ. There's no multiple gods or multiple things or people you devote your time to. It is one God. There's one faith, one baptism, which when we see like the baptism of water, the going down, death to self, resurrection in Christ, being made anew, the death of the inner man, being made anew in Christ, the Holy Spirit and the life of Christ being lived out in you. And the final verse, verse 6, One God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. So since he is Lord and Master, he is God and Father. And he's God and Father. He's loved us enough to choose us as his image in this world. And again, loved us enough to the point that he saved us. Over all, through all, and in all. That's over us. We are humbled by that because he's our creator over us, but he's also in us. He works in us, in the church. The church glorifies him, and he blesses us because of what we do and because of what he did. It fulfills each other. So the question is, are we practicing those principles in our own lives so that we strengthen the body of Christ? Are we humbled to one another as God was or as we were before God our maker and does that lead to us being humble to one another in that same way that not one of us is more righteous than the other do we have patience with one another as we have with the calling God has set before us do we bear with one another in love not because it's laborious or we have to not because it's just an obligation but because Christ has loved us so much how much more should we love one another as well. It will bring unity through the spirit and the bond of peace. The same peace as it says that surpasses all understanding that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the same peace because we believe. And to fully experience that life and to fully live that worthy life to the fullest. We can grasp that in living out these principles. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you. We, you um, yeah, I thank you. We could be here to study your word, worship through song, worship together as a church body. I pray we would go forward in humility because you humbled yourself to death. That we would be meek. We would have patience. We would bear with one another in love. And because of that, there would be a great unity in the body of Christ. And it would start with us focusing on what we need to work on in our own lives. Thank you, God. Amen. Let's sing.
I thank you for this day that uh, we could be here studying your word. I pray as we all leave this place that we would travel safely, be back next week to study your word, worship together in unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you.